I welcome everybody back to Premier's Questions. Louis French. Yeah. Question number one, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'd like to start by congratulating Serena Wiegmann and the Lionesses for their fantastic yeah. performance at the World Cup. We are all incredibly proud of them. Mr Speaker, I also know the whole House will want to join me in sending condolences to the family, friends and colleagues of Sergeant Graham Saville. It is a testament to his bravery that he died in the line of duty and a terrible reminder of the work the police do every day to keep us safe. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Louis Fletch. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Labour Party used to claim that it represents working class people. But Labour's ULEZ expansion to Greater London will now hammer millions of working people with bills of £12.50 per day or £4,500 per year. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it is unacceptable for Londoners and those in surrounding counties to face this regressive and unacceptable tax, and will he do everything that he can to help working people? Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I agree with my hon. Friend. It is disappointing that last week the Labour leader allowed the Labour Mayor to introduce you as charging hard-working people £12.50 every time they start their car adding to their burden of the cost of living. All I can say, Mr Speaker, is while we focus on helping hard-working families, all he does is punish them. We now, we now come to lead of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the Lionesses and his comments about Sergeant Saville? I think we all speak for the whole House when we speak on that subject. I'd also like to extend the warmest welcome to our new Labour member for Selby and Ainsty. Yeah. He's already made history for the Labour Party by overturning the largest Tory majority ever in a by-election. Yeah. And I'd also welcome the honourable members for Uxbridge and South Ryslip, Somerton and Froome. Yeah. Mr Speaker. The roof of Singlewell Primary School in Gravesend collapsed in May 2018. Thankfully, it happened at the weekend and no children were injured. The concrete ceiling was deemed dangerous and liable to collapse, and everyone knew the problem existed in other schools. Yet the Prime Minister decided to halve the budget for school maintenance just a couple of years later. Does he agree with his Education Secretary that he should be thanked for doing a good job. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I know how concerned parents, children and teachers are, and I want to start by assuring them that the government is doing everything it can to fix this quickly and minimise the disruption to children's education. We make no apology for acting decisively in the face of new information. And let me provide the House with an update on where we are. Of the 22,000 schools in England, the vast, vast majority won't be affected. In fact, in two-thirds of inspections of suspected schools, RAC is not actually present. And to tackle the 1% of schools that have been affected so far, the 1%, we are assigning each of those schools a dedicated caseworker and providing extra funding to fix the problem. In the majority of cases, children will attend school as normal, and the mitigations take typically just days or weeks to complete. We will do everything we can to help parents, support teachers, and get children back to normal school life as quickly as possible. Well, Mr Speaker, Wood Green Academy in Sandwell was on Labour's building list in 2010. They scrapped it and now children there are in a crumbling school. The head of the National Audit Office accuses him of taking a sticking plaster approach. The NAO report says he cut £869 million. The person who ran the Department for Education says he is personally responsible. On Monday, he leapt to his own defence, saying it is utterly wrong to blame him. So why does literally everyone else say it's his fault. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the professional advice from the technical experts on RAG has, has evolved over time, and indeed, 
It is something that successive governments have dealt with, dating back to 1994, Mr Speaker. Now, as new advice has come forward, the government has rightly, decisively and swiftly acted in the face of that advice. But he, he talked about school budgets and talked about what I had done, but let me just walk him through the facts of actually what that spending review did, because he brought it up. Well, no, he's brought it up, so presumably he would like to hear the facts. Funding for school maintenance and rebuilding will average £2.6 billion a year over this Parliament as a result of that spending review, which represents a 20% increase on the years before. Indeed, indeed, Mr Speaker, far from cutting budgets, as he alleges, the amount spent last year was the highest in a decade. That spending review, that spending review maintained, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that spending review maintained the school rebuilding programme, delivering 500 schools over a decade, a pace completely consistent with what had happened previously. And, Mr. Speaker, it is worth pointing out that during the parliamentary debates on that spending review, the Labour Party and him did not raise the issue of RAC one single time. So before he jumps on the next political bandwagon, he should get his facts straight. Mr Speaker, Carmel College in Darlington was on the Labour's building list in 2010. They scrapped it, and now children there are in a crumbling school. And on the one hand, we have him saying it's nothing to do with him. On the other side, we have the facts. And there's a simple way to clear this up. Why doesn't he commit to publish the requests from the Department of Education for the school rebuilding programme and what risks he was warned of before he turned them down? Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman has now brought up twice the Labour Labour school rebuildings programme. He's now brought it up twice. So let's just look at that and look at the facts surrounding that, because we do know the truth about that programme, Mr Speaker, because the NAO, as he's called on, actually reviewed that programme later on. What did they define? They found that Labour school rebuilding programme actually excluded 80% of schools. Next, what did they find? What did they find? That it was a third more expensive than it needed to be, needlessly wasting resources that have gone to schools. And Mr Speaker, and Mr. Speaker this is the worst bit. The worst bit is that that programme, because now he's talking about the physical condition of schools, that programme only allocated funds solely on the basis of ideology, with no regard whatsoever to the physical condition of schools, Mr Speaker. That's why the Independent James Review described that programme as time-consuming and expensive, just like the Labour Party. (laughs) We don't want to start off with somebody leaving so early, because that's what's going to happen, Keir Starmer. Well, Mr Speaker, they want more, so let me continue. Ferry Hall School in County Durham was on Labour's building list in 2010. They scrapped it and now children there are in a crumbling school. The truth is, this crisis is the inevitable result of 13 years of cutting corners, botched jobs, sticking plaster politics. It's the sort of thing you expect from cowboy builders, saying that everyone else is wrong, everyone else is to blame, protesting they've done an effing good job, even if the ceiling falls in. The difference, Mr Speaker, is that in this case, the cowboys are running the country. Isn't he ashamed that after 13 years of Tory government, children are cowering under steel supports, stopping their classroom roof, falling in? No more. Just seriously, I will calm down. First session, I understand people are excited to be back at school. Will we expect better behaviour, Prime Minister? Well, Mr Speaker, this is exactly the kind of political opportunism that we've come exactly the kind of opportunism that we've come to expect from Captain Hindsight over here. Before, before today, before today, he's never once raised this issue with me across this dispatch box. It wasn't even worthy of a single It's the same for this side as well. Can I just say We're going to have a calmer, 
question times going forward. I want to hear the question and I want to hear the answers, just like your constituents. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, before today he never once raised this issue with me in Parliament. It wasn't even worthy of a single mention in his so-called landmark speech on education this summer. And if we'd listened to him, our kids would have been off school and locked down for longer. It's as simple as that. He talks about 13 years. Well, let's see what happened. When we, in, when we came into office, two-thirds of schooled were good and outstanding. Now it's 90 per cent, Mr Speaker. We introduced the pupil premium to get more funding to the most disadvantaged pupils, Mr Speaker. Today they are 75 per cent more likely to go to university. And as a result of our reforms, we now have the best readers in the Western world, Mr Speaker. What 13 years of education reform gets you, all of which opposed by the party opposite. But it claims to be a man of detail. There are 100 parliamentary questions from this side on this issue and an opposition day motion. But, Mr. Speaker, let us continue. Holy Family Catholic School in Bradford was on the Labour building list in 2010. They scrapped it, and now children there too are in a crumbling school. Um, Mr. Holden, I think I've heard enough. No, then, this is the last time you make your mind up. You either go no or you're quiet for the rest of this. And, Mr. Speaker, if you can believe it, in April this year, the Education Secretary signed a contract for refurbishment of her offices. It's got a personal stamp of approval on it. It cost, I can't quite believe this, £34 million. Can he explain to parents? whose children aren't at school this week, why he thinks a blank cheque for he Tory minister's office is better use of taxpayers' money than stopping schools collapsing. Well, Mr Speaker, what I'd say to parents is, in the receipt of new information, we have acted decisively to ensure the safety of children and minimise disruption to education, as we have laid out and communicated extensively. That is the right thing to do. And I would also gently point out to him, Mr Speaker, whilst the Department for Education started this process 18 months ago in spring of last year, as far as I can tell, in Labour-run Wales, they still don't know which schools are affected. Mr. Speaker. But again, he brought up this issue of funding, Mr. Speaker. And again, let's look back to what happened in that spending review. Because in that spending review, I increased the Department for Education's capital budget by 25% to a record £7 billion, Mr. Speaker. It tripled the amount that we spend on children with special education needs and disabilities. It improved the condition of the overlooked FE estate and it set the course for per pupil funding to be the highest ever. But it also also, Mr Speaker, crucially, invested £5 billion to help our pupils recover the lost learning from COVID. £5 billion, Mr Speaker, and he might remember that because he, we wanted pupils learning, he wanted longer lockdowns. Yes, I, I, I think he just doesn't get how this it's all fine out there yeah. is so at odds with the lived experience of millions of working people across yeah. this country. Yeah. And Mr Speaker, let's go on. This is a long list. At least, six, at least six schools in Essex were on Labour's building list in 2010. They scrapped them and now children there are in crumbling schools. What he won't admit is the reason he cut these budgets, ignored the warnings, is quite simple. Just like he thought his tax rises were for other families to pay, he thinks his school cuts are for other families to endure. Doesn't it tell you everything you need to know? That he's happy to spend millions of taxpayers' money sprucing up Tory offices, billions to ensure there's no VAT on Tory school fees, but he won't lift a finger when it comes to protecting other people's schools, other people's safety, other people's children. Mr Speaker, I, I know he comes here with these prepared scripts, but he hasn't listened to a single fact, a single fact of six questions about the record amounts of funding going into schools, about the incredible reforms to education impacting the most disadvantaged children in our society, a record that we are rightly proud of. And yes, 
Of course, he can, of course we can name the schools. That's because we are reacting to information and publishing that information, Mr Speaker, so we know where the issues are, something that we're still waiting for by the Welsh Government in Wales. But, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, of course he wants to try and score political points of something that we are dealing with in the right and responsible way. But I do note that he has not mentioned a single other thing that has happened since we last met across these dispatch boxes, Mr. Speaker. He talked about hard-working families across Britain, but what's happened? Energy bills down, Mr. Speaker. What's happened to inflation? Down, Mr. Speaker. What's happened to small boat crossings? Down, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes, Mr. Speaker, and when it comes to economic growth, what's happened? It's gone up, Mr. Speaker. He tried, he tried time and time again to talk down the British economy, but people weren't listening, thankfully. His entire economic narrative has been demolished, and the Conservatives are getting on delivering for Britain. There will be more. Nicola Richards. Inflation falling, energy bills coming down, growth up. People in the West Midlands are disappointed to see that Labour run Birmingham City Council has gone bankrupt. As a Samwell resident and a West Bromwich MP, I'm no stranger to Labour incompetence. Does the Prime Minister agree that Labour have demonstrated yet again that they always run out of other people's money? Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is exactly right. Uh, we started by hearing how Labour in London are charging hard-working people with ULES. Now we're hearing about how Labour in Birmingham are failing hard-working people, losing control of taxpayers' money and driving their finances into the ground. They've bankrupted Birmingham, Mr Speaker. We can't let them bankrupt Britain. Yeah. We come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the public needs no reminding that today marks a year since the Prime Minister's predecessor yeah. took office. Yeah. And upon her speedy departure, they will have thought that things were going to get better. But when we look at unemployment figures, they are higher. When we look at food prices, they are higher. When we look at mortgage rates, they are higher. And economic growth is stagnant. So can I ask the Prime Minister, when is he going to get off his backside and do something about it. Yeah. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think the, what the Honourable Gentleman failed to point out is that the amount of times I've sat across the dispatches from him and his colleagues and heard how somehow we were a laggard when it came to growth, Mr. Speaker. What he didn't do is take the opportunity to correct the record today, yeah. now that the pub figures have been published, which demonstrate, in fact, we had the fastest recovery out of any European economy after COVID. Yeah. You, Mr Speaker, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the Prime Minister thinks everything is all right. But let's look at his proposals for the winter when it comes to a cost of living package. Because when it comes to energy bills, his plan, of course, is to do nothing. When it comes to mortgage bills, his plan is to do nothing. And when it comes to food bills, his plan is to do nothing. So when the shadow... So, well, sorry, when the Secretary of State for Sue, Education Sue, Sue. said earlier this week that everyone was doing nothing. She was referring to the Prime Minister, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I think it's a, it's a little bit out of practice, because when it comes to energy bills, what we have done is pay for around half of a typical family's energy bill over the past year. Support worth £1,500, Mr Speaker, benefiting families in Scotland. He asks about mortgages, Mr Speaker. The Chancellor's mortgage charter covers 90% of the mortgage market and ensures that a typical mortgage holder can save hundreds of pounds a month when it comes to their mortgage refinancing. And when he talked about energy, thanks to the actions of this Government, we are supporting the hundreds of thousands of jobs in the Scottish oil and gas industry, yeah. securing this country's energy yeah. supply, something that he opposes. Yeah. I will always do what's right for the people of Scotland, Mr Speaker, and it's time the SNP did the same. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was delighted when the Prime Minister last year said that on his watch we would not lose swathes of farmland to solar applications, instead rightly arguing for solar to be installed on rooftops, yet my constituency sees a constant flow of planning applications for solar farms and battery storage plants on food-producing 
land. So can I ask my right honourable friend, when will his pledge become a reality? Yeah, quite right. Quite right. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend makes an excellent point. Now, solar is one of the cheapest forms of electricity generation, so it's right that we try and see more of it across the country. But we do need to protect our most valuable agricultural land so that they can produce food for the nation and increase our food security. And that's why, thanks for our changes, the planning system now sets this out explicitly with a clear preference for brownfield sites. Now, of course, we want to do more to encourage barn top solar, uh, Mr. Speaker, and DEFRA will be updating the House with further information on that policy in due course. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Prime Minister stated that he was proud of his furlough scheme. I wonder, Mr. Speaker, if he's equally proud of the 400 billion it put on the national debt and the inflation it's caused. Was he proud of the jobs lost, businesses closed, and lives crushed due to the lockdowns? Is he proud of the increased NHS waiting list, premature deaths, and the one million young people now needing mental health support? And finally, Mr. Speaker, is he is he is he proud of the excess deaths affecting every one of our constituencies that nobody wants to talk about? And will he give an undertaking to the British public, a solemn undertaking that they will never be inflicted upon them ever again? Well. Mr Speaker, as the honourable gentleman knows, there is a formal inquiry regarding COVID which will examine all the decisions uh, that were made, including, including lockdown and the impacts of them. Uh, but with regard to the furlough scheme, Mr Speaker, I am proud that at a time of extreme anxiety in the country, facing an unprecedented situation, that this government put its arms around the British public to ensure that we protected 10 million jobs. And as the report from the ONS showed last week, those actions, combined with all the other things we did to support the economy ensured that we had the fastest recovery through the pandemic of any European nation. Dr. Neil Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a nation of animal lovers, the Conservatives' government uh, record on animal welfare is a source of great pride. But sadly, too many abuses remain from pet theft, the smuggling of puppies and heavily pregnant dogs, and dogs with their ears horrifically cropped, to the illegal export of horses to Europe for slaughter. These issues are personal to me as a veterinary surgeon and to my constituents, especially animal theft and livestock worrying. Can the Prime Minister reassure the House that animal welfare is a key government priority and that he will bring forward the necessary legislation to tackle these issues as soon as possible? Mr Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for both raising this issue but also his work and expertise in the area. Uh, you know, I'm proud that thanks to the actions that previous governments have taken with regard to things like cat microchipping, the ivory ban, or indeed raising the maximum sentence for animal cruelty to five years. We are now the highest ranked G7 nation when it comes to World Animal Protection's uh, Animal Protection Index. But we are determined to go even further and deliver on our manifesto commitments individually during the remainder of this parliament. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has said he will lead a government of honesty, accountability and integrity. So can the Prime Minister explain how he was found to have breached the Code of Conduct, this time for failing to declare his wife's shares in a childcare agency, which received a monetary boost from measures in his budget? Uh, Mr Speaker, if the Honourable Lady reads the full uh, transcript and the full findings, she will see a detailed explanation of what happened, which the Commissioner described as a minor and inadvertent breach. But given that... Given that uh, at the time I was not aware of the policy that was being discussed with me uh, and corrected it later on and could have corrected it with slightly different language, she'll also know that I'm not the only person across these dispatch boxes that has had the same thing happen to them. John Penrose. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I interest the Prime Minister in proposals from the Carbon Competitiveness Commission, which I chair, which would deliver net zero cheaply and without deindustrialising our economy? It would help British manufacturers placing imports from countries with lower energy costs make our exports more competitive everywhere and cut fuel duty here at home. We have strong backing from Britain's heavy industries, cross-party support from the excellent member from Aberavon, who I see is also on the order paper. So would the Prime Minister consider adding his name to our list of supporters as well? 
Uh, well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend and the Commission for Carbon Competitiveness for the report that he's worked on and highlighted. The government is absolutely committed to putting in place the necessary policies for UK industry to decarbonise successfully. Uh, as he will be aware, government recently consulted on addressing carbon leakage in particular with a range of potential options. We are in the process of considering those responses and will issue a formal response in due case. In due Claire case. Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every year, billions of wet wipes uh, go out into our rivers and oceans and clog up our sewers. Yeah. I've been campaigning on this for years to ban plastic in wet wipes, and the government has finally promised to ban plastic in wet wipes, but that was five months ago and there's been nothing since then. So will the Prime Minister today finally give a date when that ban will come into force and make a difference to our environment, or is this another broken promise from his zombie government? Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, in the comprehensive plan for water that was published by the Environment Secretary in April, uh, we did confirm our intention to ban wet wipes uh, containing plastic, subject, of course, as is legally proper, subject to a public consultation. That consultation will be launched uh, in the coming months in autumn of this year, and I know ministers will keep the House updated on progress. Greg McKinley. I would like to offer some assistance on the small boats issue. Has my right hon. Friend considered the incongruity of uh, the fact that a, a UK uh, dinghy manufacturer uh, trying to sell into the EU market would have to apply the CE marking, customs codes uh, and the potential of being stopped and checked, uh, and similar applies perversely when a simple thing like GB to NI trade. But none of this applies, seemingly, uh, when these huge, supersized, dangerous, cut and shut uh, dinghies are taken in from Turkey across the EU border into Bulgaria and Greece. Is he as confused as I am by the EU's double standards on this matter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my, uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we must do all we can to stop the boats and tackle illegal migration. And we know that the export of small boats across parts of the European continent is a vital element of the smuggling gangs' tactics. And that's why, specifically, we are stepping up joint operations with Turkey, eh, Mr Speaker. And I raised this with the President when we spoke, <laughs> so that we can tackle organised immigration crime and specifically disrupt the supply chain of boat parts that are used for these dangerous crossings. And I will continue to keep him updated on our progress. Luke Pollard. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two years ago in Plymouth, we lost five people in the worst mass shooting the country has seen for a decade. The government has finally consulted on firearms reform, but after pressure from shooting groups, even these sensible measures look like they could be watered down. So will the Prime Minister bow down to lobbyists from the shooting industry, or will he stand with the grieving families and those in Plymouth who want to see no other tragedy like this ever happen again with stronger gun laws. Well, Mr Speaker, I know how important this issue is to the honourable gentleman following the horrific shooting in his constituency, and my thoughts are with the family of all those who were killed. Uh, he will know that firearms are subject to stringent controls, and rightly so, but those controls are kept under constant review. For example, we have taken action to improve information sharing between GPs and the police to make sure that people are not given access to firearms without their medical conditions being checked, and the statutory guidance for chief officers of police have been improving so that how people apply for firearms is, uh, is assessed properly, including checks on social media. With regard to the matter that he specifically raises, the Home Office is in the process of considering responses to that consultation and will respond in due course. Stephen Metcalf. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, later today, Mr Speaker, I am bringing forward a 10-minute rule bill uh, to include the provision of automated external defibrillators in all new housing developments of 10 dwellings or more. Will my right hon. Friend therefore support this provision and ask his relevant Cabinet colleagues to engage with me on to ensure these life-saving pieces of equipment can become commonplace where they can have the most impact close to people's homes. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right to highlight the importance of these life-saving devices, uh, and that's why the National Planning Policy Framework already expects planning policies and decisions to promote public safety, but it's also why recently the Government launched a million pound fund which will place around a thousand new defibrillators in communities across England to help improve equality of access to these life-saving devices. And the MacDonald. In, in 2019, Outwood Academy's Riverside Free School application in Middlesbrough was approved, with its first year seven intake 
arriving the following year. And that has happened every year uh, since, but there's still no new building. I've had no response to my request for a meeting with the Secretary of State, but that original intake are destined to spend their entire secondary education in various temporary adapted premises. Mr Speaker, with pupils being shunted around old yeah. buildings, yeah. talk of levelling up and addressing the GSE attainment gap rings hollow. Yeah. So can the Prime Minister and his Education Secretary get off their derriers and sort this out. Yeah. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm happy to ensure that the Honourable Gentleman gets uh, an answer to the specific question he raised on the school. But more generally, I'm proud of what the Government's doing in Teesside and the Tees Valley to support education, with the recent announcement of new six forms, but also as an education improvement area, receiving extra funding and resources. And that's why we've seen standards in reading and maths increase considerably, and we're determined to keep going. They did for tell. Because the Prime Minister is aware of how the rack issue has really affected schools in Essex. Uh, we've got a high number of schools that have been impacted, and he's rightly said today that the government's doing everything it can to get children back to school. Um, can he try to commit, and I know there's a debate later on today, to fully fund in both the capital and revenue costs that are associated with getting children back into school? And I, I would hope that he would um, commit to meeting the leader of Essex County Council, because they are pioneering some great reforms right now, where they are looking to support, maintain schools, as well as a Trust, and I think actually the government could get some good insights in terms of how we can get children back to school fast and also look at the funding model for this. Can I, uh, can I first of all start by thanking my right honourable friend for the engagement constructively that she's had with the department and indeed uh, pay tribute to her school leaders and local authority for everything that they are doing. I am happy to give her the reassurance, as the Chancellor already said, new funding will be provided to schools to deal with this issue, but also to ensure that we can get through this as quickly as possible for her constituents and parents and indeed everyone's. DFE are in the process of increasing the number of dedicated caseworkers from 50 to 80. We have 30 35 project directors regionally on the ground to support, and we've increased the number of survey firms uh, by more than double, Mr. Speaker, so that we can rapidly, over the next few weeks, fully assess all the relevant schools and have a mitigation plan in place. Stephen Kinner. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Steelworkers in my Aberavon constituency have watched in frustration as other governments have pumped investment yes. into decarbonisation, while successive Tory governments have sat on their hands. So when will the Prime Minister finally conclude the talks with Tata Steel and can he guarantee that there will be a le matching level of investment with what other European governments are doing on decarbonisation and will he guarantee that the conclusion will be based on serious engagement comprehensively with the steel unions? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, steel is absolutely vital to the UK. This is something that, of course, is of interest to the Honourable Gentleman, but something that I've also discussed extensively with my Honourable Friend from Scunthorpe, and that's because the industry supports local jobs and economic growth. Now, conversations with specific companies like Tata are ongoing, but they are understandably commercially sensitive. But we do share the ambition of securing a decarbonised, sustainable and competitive future for the industry in this country. And in the meantime, we are supporting the sector, Mr Speaker, with our energy industries exemption which provides discounted energy bills and the industrial energy transformation fund which supports steel companies with their energy bills and the transition through capital to a greener future. Mark Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Two weeks ago the government announced that the Bolsover schools uh, bid for a sixth form in my constituency has been successful. Yeah. 2% of school leavers at 16 years old across the country go on to a sixth form. But in Bolsover, it's 23%, in Clown, 22 and in Shirebrook, it's 7%. So will the Prime Minister join me in thanking the Red Hill Academy Trust, Matthew Hall, the head teacher of Bolsover School, and all of those who have helped to bring a sixth form to Bolsover? Yeah. Well, uh, can I congratulate Red Hill and everyone involved with the successful bid? Uh, for the new sixth form in Bolsover. I'm delighted that the bid was successful because my honourable friend uh, I know shares my desire to ensure a world-class education for every single one of our young people across the country because that is the best way to provide them with the opportunity for a better life and this new programme of sixth forms will deliver that in his constituency and many others across the nation. Yeah. Very grateful Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the North East has been underfunded in terms of transport investment for decades. 
HS2, meant to be an economic development and connectivity lifeline, now not coming anywhere near. And the A1 Northumberland dueling decision delayed yet again, and our regional rail service is still running on outdated infrastructure and rolling stock. With all that in mind, will the Prime Minister commit to funding to re reopen the Leam side line from Gateshead to County Durham to take pressure off the East Coast main line and aid economic well-being movement of passengers and freight services in the north east of England, or is levelling up just a, just a ret rhetoric? Well, Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I would say to the Honourable Gentleman, obviously it wouldn't be right for me to comment on specific projects, but to give him a sense of our commitment, what I can tell him is that in real terms, in real terms since 2010, we have spent over a third more in central capital investment in northern transport every single year since 2010 compared to Labour's last six years in government, Mr Speaker. That's what we're doing for northern transportation, and specifically when it comes to re reopening and restoring railway lines, where was the first one we did? From Ashington to Blythe. Yeah. Limrag. Yeah, I have a cheerful question that I know my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, will find impossible to resist, because he will be aware of the work I've been doing um, with the uh, number 10's UK uh, Ambassador for Mental Health, Dr Alex George, to establish early intervention mental health hubs across the country. Now, we've got the pilot, which seems lost somewhere between the Treasury and the Department of Health, but I know he'll sort that problem out. But I wonder if he will be able to meet with Dr Alex George and myself to discuss it further, because these hubs will make a massive difference to constituencies across the country, because we all know the problems with CAMS and the perverse situation where children and young people have to get progressively worse before they get the treatment they need. I know he'll be very supportive of this one, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Well, Mr, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I know my honourable friend is rightly a passionate advocate for improving mental health support for young people, something that I know we are doing and I'm proud of our record, particularly increasing the number of mental health support teams that work with schools and expanding community services. Uh, I know DHSE is looking at the role that early support hubs might play uh, in this uh, plan, but I'm very happy to meet my honourable friend personally to discuss how we can push this through. Mary Glenn. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. We've heard far too much lately about ministerial posteriors and very little about prosperity for the country, even in these dying days of the lame duck government. Will the Prime Minister stop prevaricating and subscribe to the Horizon programme for the sake of vital British science, innovation and cancer research? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Mr. Speak, Mr Speaker, this is a government that is investing, investing record sums in British science and research and development because we believe that it is critical to a brighter economic future and spreading opportunity. Now, our priority and preference is to associate to Horizon, but we do want to make sure that that is on terms that are right, both for the British taxpayer and for British science and research. I can commit to her that we have been extensively involved in discussions. I hope to be able to conclude those successfully, and when we do, I hope she will be the first to stand up and congratulate the government. Dame Caroline Dynage. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, but it also marks two years since the death of my constituent, Sophie Farrell. She was only 10 years old. Every day in the UK, Mr. Speaker, 10 young people will be diagnosed with cancer, and two of those will not survive. Those that do face a lifetime of side effects from treatments that are just not designed for small bodies. When will the Prime Minister publish a Childhood Cancer Action Plan? Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank my uh, honourable friend for raising this issue and extend my sympathies to her constituent and family as she raised. Uh, she's right to continue campaigning in this important area. Uh, I hope she'll understand that I can't preempt the content specifically of the strategy, but I can tell her that it will draw on previous work, including submissions from childhood cancer charities and stakeholders to our recent calls for evidence. Of course, we want to hear from them to highlight and get a sense of the issues that she specifically raised, but I'm sure uh, I'll ensure that we write to her to give her a sense of timing. Chris Law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every year, the SNP Scottish Government mitigates against the cruelest of Westminster policies by spending £84 million supporting hard-working families against the brutal bedroom tax and over £6.2 million covering the two-child benefit cap. Astonishingly, Mr. Speaker, we have learned over the summer that the Leader of the Opposition is an enthusiastic supporter of these Tory cruel welfare policies, with U-turn after U-turn from the Labour Party. 
So given that the Tories and Labour are two cheeks of the same arse, offering no change, no vision, no hope, does the Prime Minister agree that the only way Scottish voters can rid themselves of these... Oh, 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 no. I'm not going to both stand up, so one of us is going to give way and it won't be me. Can I just say, let's think about language, let's be more temperate and let's make sure that this Parliament can be proud. The pride of this Parliament will shine through, but certainly not using language. Happy to change the offending word with bottom. <laughs> Given that the Tories and Labour are two cheeks of the same bottom, offering no change, no vision and no hope, does the Prime Minister agree that the only way for Scottish voters to rid themselves of these heinous policies is to vote SNP to leave Westminster forever. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, obviously not, but I think, the, I think the thrust of that question was directed at the Leader of the Opposition rather than me. I won't want to get in the middle of that, but what I can say is we want to ensure a welfare system that is compassionate and looks after the most vulnerable in our society, while supporting those who can into work to do so, because that's also fair for everyone else and British taxpayers. I believe that is a system that we are achieving, Mr Speaker, and right now we're providing thousands of pounds of support to help with energy bills and everything else to people in Scotland, and we will continue to do so. So. That completes Prime Minister's questions, I'll wrap them. Just sit down a minute.